Good morning. Welcome to Discovery's Digital Gathering. We are glad you're here. We are excited for what God has in store this morning. We want to invite you to download our app, which will help you stay current with our community and get further connected by filling out our new visitor card. Let's prepare our hearts for worship and for the adventure of discovering the good news of Jesus together. Good morning, friends. Welcome to the Digital Gathering. My name is Steve. I'm your host this morning. I'm also the lead pastor here at Discovery. Let's prepare our hearts, our minds, our souls for worship this morning with this reading from Psalm 119. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much. Preserve my life, Lord, according to your word. Accept, Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. The word of the Lord. Good morning, Discovery. Come on, let's worship today. From the dark. I called your name Into the darkness Your mercy came Cut me out Lifted me up How great is your love You took my weakness Turned me in my shame Buried my burden Lifted me up, how great is your love. From the heights of heaven, you stepped down to earth. Innocent perfection, gave your life for us. And we stand amazed, and we stand in awe. For we have been changed by the power of
Well, thank you again for tuning in. Thank you, James, for leading us in worship. Given the uh, spike, right, the wave of COVID moving through Davis uh, the last couple of weeks, I'm guessing a few more of you are tuning in online today. So welcome. We're glad that you're with us. Thanks again for joining in the digital gathering and continuing to follow along with what's going on here at Discovery uh, in this way. We're grateful to be able to do this together. A couple of things that I want to invite you into this morning um, for all of us. If you have not ever downloaded the Discovery Christian Church app, it is a great tool of connection here for our community. You can download that from any of the, the app uh, stores um, and onto it, just about any device, and that will get you access to all kinds of things. Um, the Bible, uh, our Bible reading plan, a, a chat forum to connect with other people at Discovery. And then you can also fill out our Connect card. It's one of the very first things you click on once you get to the main page there. And just a couple pieces of information will get you well on your way to being plugged in here at Discovery. Uh, so download the app, stay tuned that way. Continue to follow us on social media with updates and announcements as they, as they come again with things being sort of fluid right now. We're, we're doing our best to keep people safe and, and to maintain um, uh, safety within our community. So just continue to follow along with those updates as they become available. Now, having said all that, there are some really exciting things happening now and in the next couple of weeks. Our mid-sized communities are restarting, so if you're not connected with one of those, it's a new year. This is a great time to get involved with the mid-sized community. This is our primary space for community life, for deeper relationships, for processing scripture together, uh, for worship. All kinds of wonderful things happen in mid-sized communities. If you've never checked one out, again, now is a wonderful time to do that. All the information for those can be found on the app and our webpage. One other thing is, uh, every time there's a fifth Sunday in a month, we take that Sunday off uh, from gathering for worship to serve our community. So the next one of those is coming up here in this month in January, January 30th. We will be uh, serving in a variety of different capacities around our, our city. Part of our, uh, our call, really our mission, to be a blessing to people here in Davis and Yolo County. Uh, more information about that and, and opportunities to sign up for different assignments will be coming out in the next couple of weeks. But right now, we just want to have you save that date. J uh, again, January 30th is going to be the next Serve Sunday. Now, speaking of serving, generosity, all that good stuff, each time we gather, we pause for a moment to reflect on God's goodness, God's generosity towards us, the many ways in which He has blessed us, and, and particularly financially, how we're able to then take some of what God has given us and give it back to Him to be used for His mission and purposes here at Discovery, but not just here, but also all around the world with some of the partners that we have who are helping people discover the good news of Jesus in, in different parts of our state, country, and world. We, uh, as a community, aim to give worshipfully, missionally, and sacrificially. And so from that posture, we invite you to give this morning through our app, webpage, or you can even e uh, mail, not email, you can mail a check to our downtown center right here, and our staff will process that as soon as it gets here. All right, let's pray for this morning's offering. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your generosity towards us. Your unlimited and unmerited favor grace, love that you desire to lavish upon us. God, we're so grateful for the ways that you've done that through Jesus, through his death and resurrection, and then in so many very specific and individual ways in our lives, God. Help us to continue to, to lean into generosity as a community, to give worshipfully, missionally, and sacrificially so that many people discover and know the good news of Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. I want to invite you to meet me, at least to start off with this morning in Acts chapter 17. We're going to actually be in a number of different places in Scripture today, but we're going to start in Acts 17. So if you have a physical Bible, look that up, have that out in front of you, and then be prepared to follow along as we jump around to some different uh, places in Scripture. Acts chapter 17. Before we get to that, though, just a couple of, of quick updates. One is last Sunday... We had our first Sunday with kids programming back in our live in-person gatherings in the theater. I got to be a part of that. I, I was a volunteer teacher, and it was just a really sweet time to welcome kids back into that space 
and, uh, and, and to begin our new program with them. Our team who's been working on that is just outstanding. They've been um, so excited, so much creativity, a lot of great ideas there. It's a really special thing to be able to have kids programming on Sunday morning. Again, if you are comfortable coming to in-person gatherings and you have kids, want to invite you to, to bring your kids, um, have them be a part of that community. They're growing in relationship together and also in their understanding of, of God and the good news of Jesus for their own age, again, with their own friends. So really, really cool stuff happening there. The other thing I wanted to update you guys on is that during Advent, we had this generosity challenge, right? Over the past several months, we've been partnering with World Relief, a global organization, but they have an office in Sacramento, and primarily the Sacramento team has been helping Afghan refugees as they resettle in the greater Sacramento area. We've done some practical things to serve with them, and then during Advent, we wanted to uh, uh, collect some funds that we could give them to, that they can use to help people get apartments, to you know, furnish those apartments, stock those apartments with all the basic goods that you need in a home. We were able to raise just shy of $9,000 as a church. We sent that off this week to them. Really exciting. I'm just so grateful for your generosity towards uh, that effort and, and towards, again, being a blessing for people who are having to restart their entire lives. And I'm just really... Uh, really grateful for the work of World Relief and that we get to be a part of that with them. So way to go, Discovery. Thank you for your generosity. A very cool story. And there's going to be more with World Relief coming in the not-too-distant future. So be, uh, be looking forward to that. Now, one final thing before we get into, into Scripture and into our conversation today. Again, I mentioned this earlier, but there's been you know, this wave of COVID moving through Davis. And I just wanted to pause for a, a moment this morning and just pray about that. Um, We've been in this for almost two years now. This has been a continual prayer for us, but just want to reiterate that we are here to serve. We're here to be a blessing. We're here to love uh, our neighbors, and we want to continue to pray for God to move and to heal and to protect people uh, during this time. So would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we do, as we have many times over the last two years, ask for your intervention, for your protection, for your healing power, uh, to come in, in the lives of people. We know many people uh, impacted by this recent wave, even in the Discovery family. But whether it's talking about our church, our community, campus, just our world, God, right now continues to be so uncertain and full of fear. Um, some of that valid. Uh, but we just desperately want to see you show up. And so, God, would you give us the eyes to see that in the midst of the chaos, the ways in which you are working, protecting, healing, and moving. Help us to have the eyes to see that and then the courage to join you in that. God, we ask that this wave would, would move through quickly, that, that no lives would be lost, that the symptoms of COVID would be mild, that people would recover quickly, and we can continue to move back into the the things that we love doing, the hanging out and the conversations and the life together that we crave and need. So we pray, God, for you to move and, and for this pandemic to come to an end. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. All right, Acts chapter 17. We're in verse 10, just a couple of verses here. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now, the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. A little bit of shade there for Thessalonica. For they received the message. They received the message with great eagerness, and they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result... Many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. We begin 2022 with a three-week conversation about the Bible. We're going to spend the next couple of weeks talking about this book that all too often is vastly misunderstood. We begin today with the practice of reading Scripture. The next two weeks, we're going to get into a couple of other questions that people have about the Bible. And I'm really excited about where... The conversation goes from here. But today, the practice of reading Scripture. Remember, 
This practice conversation is an ongoing conversation for us here at Discovery. Every year we hit seven to nine different practices or spiritual disciplines because we want to be a community that doesn't just think things about Jesus. We want to be a community that lives Jesus kinds of lives. We're not just a learning community, although learning is good and important. We are an experiential participatory community, right? Our foundation here, Jesus' own words, every person who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise person who built their house on the rock. This emphasis on practice, on participation, it comes from a deep theological conviction about the ultimate meaning and purpose of life. And I recognize that's an epic kind of sounding thing, maybe audacious sounding thing to say, but it's just true. It's just true. A deep theological conviction about the ultimate meaning and purpose of life. Our core conviction is that we were created to live in relationship with God and with each other. And of course, in our fallen world, in our sinful world, there's broken relationships all all over the place between us and God and between each other. And so the good news of Jesus, the gospel, right, is that God wants to heal those relationships and has done that, provided a means for that in his son, Jesus. And so we might say it this way, we are created then for right relationship, restored relationship with God and with each other. Jesus, again, his own words, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. He says there is no greater command than these. And so the aim, the purpose, the goal, the fancy Greek word here is telos. The purpose of life is to become lovers. And I say that a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but I think you know what I mean, right? Lovers of God and lovers of people. Now, as sinful fallen people, we don't just drift into this. We can't just try really hard to be more loving and it just sort of happens, right? No, we need the unconditional love of God the Father. We need the saving grace of His Son, Jesus. We need the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to be transformed into loving people. So there's this aspect in which the Trinitarian God of the universe does this work in us changing our hearts, transforming us into more loving people. And yet at the same time, we also have a part to play. We also have a part to play in this. Work out your salvation, Philippians chapter 2. Train yourself to be godly, 1 Timothy 4. Strenuously contend with the energies that you've been given, Colossians 1. Practice the ways of Jesus, Matthew 7. God works in us and we work with God and we become transformed into people who love God and love people. Now, it's been shown over and over again, both anecdotally but also statistically, that the practice of reading Scripture is one of the central means through which God transforms us even as we work out our salvation. Now, there are a couple of dangers here because we can have this mentality of like just more Bible, more Bible, more Bible, that will solve all of our problems. But two, two dangers that I have noticed. One, uh, one of them is this, uh, a foundational text for us that we're going to hit several times over the next three weeks is that verse, that, that line from Psalm 119. And by the way, our kids are learning this too. So parents, you can ask your kids about this. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. What I see happen all too often is that people become more enamored with the lamp, the flashlight, than they do with the light that the lamp produces. Are you with me? Right? We get all like, oh, look at this, look at this flashlight, how awesome it is, how many things I've underlined. I'm mixing metaphors here, but you understand what I'm saying. We become more enamored with the Bible and less with the light that the Bible provides, right? It is a guide for us. It helps us make sense of where we are and not crash into things. It is a lamp, a light for our path. Now the other thing here is that that just Plopping the Bible open and reading for a few minutes does not automatically equate to transformation. And there's some dangers even with just reading the Bible that way that we'll talk about in the next couple of of weeks. So there, uh, there is some intentionality that needs to be at play here as we come to Scripture. Now remember, 
reading scripture in and of itself, not necessarily, again, a golden ticket towards transformation. It's part of this mix of practices that lead towards growth, confession, outreach, reading, encouragement. These are our core practices that have been shown to produce change in people's lives. My personal theory is that they're core because you cannot do them alone. You cannot do them alone. You can read your Bible alone, and that is a good thing to do. But all of those practices really come to life when they are done in community. And this is why we begin this conversation with Acts 17 and with the Berean Jews, because they highlight the importance and the beauty of reading Scripture in community. The Bereans are our model. They give us a, a vision, a picture for what our community could look like as we engage with the Scriptures. Notice a couple of things about them. They are of noble character. They receive the good news with eagerness. They examine the Scriptures daily and they do it together. You get this, I get this picture anyway of people sitting around tables in cafes and restaurants and all these spaces around, uh, around Berea and you can see them like opening the, the scriptures, talking about these things, discussing these things, arguing these things, wrestling through, okay, what does that mean? And if that's what it means, what implications does that have in, in my life? And how are you going to do that? And how can I do that? These amazing conversations that people are having about scripture daily as they wrestle through this together as a community. This is my longing and prayer for us as a church. Uh, one of my dreams is that I would go, uh, I would go uh, around, uh, around Davis and I'd bump into people and they'd be in the middle of a conversation about, oh, we talked about this thing last week in mid-sized community. We're just trying to figure out how to live that out. Or, or we've been reading this, this part of scripture together and it's given us this idea and we're just trying to uh, process that a little bit more. Or, or we heard this thing mentioned on Sunday morning and so we, get, we just decided to get coffee because we wanted to figure out how can we do that? How can we live like that? How, how, what do we need to change in order to see that kind of thing show up in our life? That's one of my dreams for us is to be the, a community that is noble, that is eager, that is daily wrestling through the truth of Scripture and what it means in our lives. Now we're going to take a little bit of a turn here for a moment then come back to that picture in Acts 17 at the end. I want to talk for just a few minutes about the why. Why read scripture? Why is it so important for us to be in this, this book, this library of books? Why is it so important for us to know the story that scripture tells? And, and my working thesis here is this. We want to know the story of scripture because there are so many other competing stories that come at us that entice us, that tempt us, that say, hey, this is a great way to live your life. Live this story. And so we need to know the story so that we can identify these other stories and ultimately so that we can say no to them in order to say yes to the story that God is writing. So what we're going to do is we're going to look very quickly at Luke chapter 4. This is a story that sets the bar very high for us when it comes to the reading of Scripture. It's the story of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. And we're only going to get to a, a couple key parts of it. And so you can be like the Bereans and you can go and examine it more later uh, when you have time. But beginning in, in verse 1 of Luke chapter 4, we see that Jesus, and this is a really key phrase here, full of the Holy Spirit, Right? Jesus, still very much a part of the Trinity, even during his time as, uh, in, in human form on earth, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. Now, as you read through this, we get the impression, you know, Luke will, will tell this story in a linear fashion, but we get the impression that this is less three moments and more of an ongoing battle that Jesus is engaged in for 40 days. 40 days where he's working through three false narratives, three false stories that we all struggle with, that we will all have to deal with at some point in our life. And what's amazing about the story of Jesus, of course, is that he comes through it by saying a resounding no to each of those stories. So this is less about three tests and more about a, a struggle with the different stories that compete for our attention. The, the three temptations, kind of on a literal perspective, are this. Verse 3, to turn stones into bread. 
verse 5, to worship Satan in exchange for the kingdoms of the world, and then verse 9, to throw, for Jesus to throw himself off of a high place so that he would be rescued and there would be this display of power. Now you might be thinking, well, those are interesting, but they have nothing to do with me. I've never been tempted to throw myself off a high place and have angels rescue me. And, and, and so I think we need to like dig a little bit into these to see that behind the temptation, again, is a story. A story that is in competition with God's story. Now, for the last 2,000 years of church history, Christians have named these temptations that Jesus faces as the flesh, the devil, and the world. And just quick pause for a moment. John Mark Comer has written a book called Live No Lies that, that goes into great depth on each of those three stories. Wonderful book if you ever want to check that out. The temptation to turn stones into bread is the story of the flesh. Bread would have felt very good to Jesus in the moment. It also would have made him quite popular with people who were struggling for daily sustenance. The story of the flesh, I think, is the do you vibe of our cultural moment, right? Whatever you think is the best thing for you to do, it can't be wrong, right? If it feels good to you, it cannot be wrong. Behind the story of the flesh is a question of trust. Who do you trust? Jesus says in response to this temptation, we do not live by bread alone. His recognition that there's more going on here than just my hunger in this moment. The story of God doesn't uh, deny our desires, but it does invite us at some level to embrace suffering and to trust our loving God, even when bread sounds really good in the moment. The story of the flesh and the question of trust. Who do you trust? The temptation for Jesus to worship Satan. This is the story of the devil, quite literal here. Worship me, Satan says, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. This is that classic devil's bargain that we see all over pop culture. Sell your soul, right? And the devil will give you whatever you want. Now, Jesus will be and is king of a kingdom, but this is a struggle of priorities, right? This is a struggle of what comes first. Here in Davis, we we prioritize things like education and achievement and security. It's a story that a lot of us live in. Those are not bad things. But what we prioritize, what comes first, very quickly reveals what we worship. And what we worship becomes our master. So when Jesus says, no, I worship Yahweh and serve him only, he's answering this deep question, who do you worship? What do you prioritize? Jesus knows he's going to be king of the kingdom. He's not going to take that route. He's going to take the route that God has set before him. So, story of the flesh, question of trust, story of the devil, question of worship, Last one is story of the world, which is this enticement to do something spectacular, right? A trick, a sign to demonstrate Jesus' power. Show everyone how awesome you are. Build your, ba- your, your brand. Grow your platform. It's interesting here, Satan actually quotes scripture in this part of the story, once again illustrating that just because something has a Bible verse attached to it doesn't make it good. This is a story, or uh, the story of the world is a story of identity, and worth and about where we draw those from. Jesus says, don't put God to the test, which is an interesting response, right? Is our quest to be famous, to to be spectacular, to be popular, is that testing God? In a sense, yes, because this is a battle for our affections. So the story of the world is a question of who do you love? Who do you love? Story of the flesh, who do you trust? Story of the devil, who do you worship? Story of the world, who do you love? Now, this scene where Jesus is tempted is often used as a way to say, okay, look, this is why you need to memorize some verses from Scripture so you can repeat the lines whenever uh, some sort of temptation pops up. In your life. Now, Jesus definitely memorized scripture. He lived in an oral culture where, where memorization was to them what the Bible app is to us, right? It was just this normal thing that you had access to. And, and I want to say this very clearly. We are all for 
memorizing scripture, but the more significant reality was not that Jesus knew a Bible verse to quote, right? It wasn't like Satan was tempting him to see like, ooh, does Jesus know how to answer this thing with a, with a passage from scripture? No, these are competing stories at the very deepest levels of who Jesus is. The, the more significant reality here is that he knew the bigger story that he was a part of, the, the bigger story that he and the Father and the Spirit were writing and are continuing to write to this very day. And so because that story was so deeply internalized in him, he was able to say no to the evil, lesser, false stories that Satan was inviting him into. This scene is less about Jesus passing a series of tests by showing off his superior Bible memory and much more about Jesus resisting the false stories of the flesh, the world, and Satan by remembering the true story, naming the true story that he is in. Scripture was so ingrained in him, his imagination so deeply formed by the story that it was the only thing that made sense for him to do. And so here's the takeaway for us. We read Scripture to be formed in the story, not to be informed. Information is good. Research is good. Uh, resources are great. But we read to be formed, not to be informed. We read so that we are formed in the true story and so that we can name and identify the false stories that are competing for our affections and our worship and our trust. Now, let's talk for just a few moments about how we practice the practice of reading Scripture. First, and this is going to sound like duh, but it's so important, I think. First is get a physical copy of the Bible. If you do not have one, we have many copies that we would love to share with you. But to me, there's something about having a physical copy of the Bible. The Bible apps are great. We have a, we have a version of that on our app. There's lots of different ways you can access Scripture. And if that's what you have, then by all means, use it. But there's something about having a physical copy of the Bible where you turn the pages and it smells a certain way and it feels a certain way in your hands. And you can look at a page you know, on a Tuesday and then three months later you can come back to that page and see, uh, see it again. And you can write notes and underline things. And it's just this very tangible experience that I think is so important for us to be able to get into it literally in that way. So if you don't have a copy of the Bible, let us know. We would love to get you a physical copy of the Bible. So get a Bible. The second thing is get a plan. There's all kinds of wonderful plans available and we have a resource for this practice on our webpage, on our app, <clears throat> and we also have a, a, a reading plan on our app that you can follow along. It starts today with Genesis 1 and over the next six months we'll take you through the big story of Scripture. There's lots of great plans. Pick one and go for it. There's something about having that, that intentionality of a plan that is so helpful in our reading of Scripture. So get a Bible, get a plan, and then here's the, the last thing, and this is really the big one. This is like, if there's one thing you take from today, may it be this. This is the importance of reading Scripture in community. Now, there are a couple of ways to do this. One of them is what I would call formal opportunities, right? Our mid-sized communities, our primary vehicle for community life here at Discovery, they are designed to process scripture together. If you're not involved in a mid-sized community, consider this your invitation. Get connected so that you can talk about, read scripture with other people. We also have one short-term group this winter quarter. It is a Lectio Divina group with Grace Cooper. Again, a beautiful technique for reading scripture in community. Um, it's going to be five weeks on Monday nights, all the information on the webpage. Check that out if you would like to try that out or if you've done it before and you, you know how, how rich that can be, go for it. So there's formal opportunities to do this. But there is also significant transformational power in the informal spaces in our lives. Back to Acts chapter 17, what I love about the Bereans as a model for us is the informal, almost spontaneous nature of the way that they immerse themselves in the scriptures. There's nothing programmatic about it. And for me, some of the most formative experiences in scripture have been in those informal settings, sitting around a campfire, in a car on a long drive, 
um, over coffee at a coffee shop where we're just asking these questions. What have you been reading? What is God showing you in scripture? Do you understand this? How are you living that out? What are you going to do with that truth? You know, how, how, can I, how can I do this? How can I make this more real in my life? One of the things that I love about our church is that there's groups of people who will go out to lunch after a gathering and discuss the teachings uh, you know, over a burrito or whatever. That's so beautiful. Like, go and do those things. And again, not in a, not in a, you know, well, I like this, I like that or whatever, but like, get into it. How do I actually do this? How can I live this out? What did you think about that? What's your interpretation of this? Wrestle with it together. Those conversations are so formational in bringing the scriptures to life in our everyday, actual lives. So just a couple of things that, that maybe will, will help spark your imagination. If you choose a reading plan, maybe find two or three other people who are doing that same plan and just meet up once a month and talk about what have you noticed? What are you learning? What are you trying to put into practice in your life? How, how, do, how can we do this together? How can we encourage one another in this? We also, in our, our Practice the Practice resource, have some books. Maybe you read a book about the Bible together and, and, and discuss some of the ideas that that sparks. But whatever you want to do or however you do it, do it together. Do it with others. Be reading Scripture in community because it comes to life. It brings it to life in all sorts of ways. Read, discuss, debate, wrestle, argue, ponder, wonder over these scriptures together in community and watch what God does in your heart and your soul and your mind. Let's pray. Father, I do just pray over our Discovery family for a moment. God, may we be a community like the Bereans, noble in character, eager to receive the word, and then diligent in that daily, regular, rhythmic practice of, of discussing, debating, processing, wondering, praying through Scripture together. May this be true of our church. And God, would you meet us? There's so many ways in which you reveal yourself to us and, and meet us in our real lives. May this be one of those ways. Through your word, would you meet us in some real transformational ways in the coming days and weeks and months? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, as we get ready for communion, I just want to end with this thought. John chapter 1, we're told that Jesus is the word. One of the reasons we take communion every week is because it's this remembrance, this celebration of who Jesus is, what he has done for us, dying in our place, that we can have that right relationship with God and with each other. But there's also this element of we, we, we have this meal, we ingest these things, this cracker that represents his body broken for us, this juice that represents his blood poured out for us, to get it in us. It's this symbolic remembering of the word inside of us. One of the New Testament writers, Paul, says, May the word of God dwell richly in you. And so we take these elements, again, to remember the big truth, the big story of God's saving, gracious, loving work in our world and in our lives, but we also do it to remember that the word comes in us. Right? And so we read Scripture, we talk about Scripture together in community so that, that story gets in us and becomes who we are so that we can identify those false stories that compete for our worship, for our trust, and for our affections. As we come to the table this morning, I want you to, to think through that a little bit. Which story is, is sort of coming after you right now? The story of the flesh, the story of the world, the story of the devil? How can you remember the true story that God is telling? Say yes to that story and no to those other stories. When you're ready, take communion with us. When darkness tries to roll over my bones And sorrow comes to steal the joy I Boom.
brokenness and pain It's all I know yeah, I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance When I'm standing your love And my fear doesn't stand a chance When I'm standing your love And my fear doesn't stand a chance when Stand in your love No longer it has a place to hide And I'm not captive to the I'm not afraid to leave my broken past behind I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken yeah. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing your love and my feet doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing your love All right, as we close our time this morning, I just want to encourage you again, may you have a plan, may you be reading scripture in community, may God show up in, in your reading and in your conversations with people. Let's go out with these words once again. Your word, God's word, a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. Grace and peace, Discovery.